Welcome to Understanding the AeroPress. This is going to be a big, giant dive into the AeroPress and how to brew with the AeroPress. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to look at all of the individual variables around AeroPress brewing. One of the delights of this brewer is that you can isolate your variables and play with them a little bit more. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to ask and answer a bunch of questions. Now, I will make sure that each individual experiment is timestamped down below if you want to jump to that, if you want to go back to a particular experiment uh, and see more about it. I'm going to use my trusty refractometer, my fancy cupping spoon, and hopefully we're going to learn some really interesting things today. So brew a cup of coffee, maybe not a big cup, because you might want to brew another one at the end of this. Two notes before we begin. Firstly, where we're doing extraction and measurement, I don't want you to really worry or look at the numbers. They are, you know, correlated to the coffee being used, to the grinder being used, which is not the same as what you're using. What we're interested in is trends, like what does a change do to extraction, broadly speaking. So we're not going to obsess over numbers. And secondly, uh, there's a mixture of tastings here. Some are kind of performative tastings, where I've done the experiments a lot before, and a few of these will actually be me tasting the experiments for the first time. Those kind of tests will be blind, whereas the other ones won't necessarily be blind. I hope that makes sense. Time for experiment one. The most obvious of them, I suppose, which is how long should I steep my AeroPress for? And the way we're going to look at it is this. I'm going to take a standard technique. I'm going to brew 12 grams to 200 grams of water. I'm going to pour all the water in one go. We're going to use the plunger to, to create a little vacuum on top to hold the brew as it steeps, and we'll give it a stir at the end of the steep time, and we'll gently press. We will do this with six different brew times, with 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds, 240 seconds, and 480 seconds. Same grind for all of them, and we'll be able to see how extraction is changed by immersion time. Of course, this isn't unique to AeroPress brewing, but it is one of the big questions, where are my diminishing returns in brew time? So let's answer that now. So here we've got our six brews from that experiment, going from 30 seconds up to four minutes in time. Uh, and if we look at the data, unsurprisingly, we see a rapid increase in extraction early on, beginning to flatten out towards this end here. And from a taste perspective, that's not very nice. It's not bad, it's just not very nice. Better, a little bit more texture, a bit more body. And as we get to this point, certainly by here, things are tasting pretty good. And I would argue for this particular grind setting, we're hitting a point of diminishing returns between two and four minutes. As we go from two minutes to four minutes, there is that little bump in quality. I think it does get a little bit sweeter in this particular sim simple test. But certainly in a cafe environment, I I'm not sure that, that I'd be willing to put the extra time in. Especially because, you know, no one would be tasting these two side by side and picking and choosing. On its own, this is a nice cup. At eight minutes, it's very nice still. Again, we doubled our brew time from here to here. I'm not sure we've seen really uh, a, a good return on our investment. You know, it, it's a tiny bit better, but not really much in this situation. For me, for this grind setting, I'd be looking at a two minute brew. Now you might argue, well, what about different grind settings? And that's a good point. If you look at the same experiment done with say a coarser grind, you'll see that the coarser you grind, the, the sort of the lower your maximum extraction is going to be, because you have less surface area, and the slower that extraction is. Okay, well then the ideal therefore is to go as fine as possible and brew as fast as possible, then that's the most efficient thing, right? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Something we will touch on a little bit later on. On now to our next experiment. So this test, relatively simple actually. You'll notice in the previous brew, before we plunged, we gave it a little stir. Well, what's actually happening there? Is there a big kick in extraction when we stir? How much of a difference does that make? So we'll do a side-by-side -side with a couple of different grind settings, doing essentially that same recipe with a stir and with no stir, just to see how that process, how that little addition impacts extraction and flavor. So here's our test, brewed our coarser set here, no stir and stir, and our finer ground set here, no stir and stir. Starting at the coarser set, really interesting difference here. The, the stir has made a massive difference actually. This cup is incredibly weak and empty and boring and hollow and dull, and has been improved quite a lot by a stir. So it's definitely bumped up the extraction quite a lot. And actually, when it came to looking at the numbers, a lot, a shocking amount here. Uh, however, where we've gone finer to start with, and we were already operating at a sort of closer to the ceiling level of extraction because we're grinding much finer, extraction's happening much quicker, the stir, well, a different story. Yes, there is an incremental increase in extraction with the stir, but it's not huge. 
right? Because we've already done a good job extracting by having a finer grind, that stir didn't make as big of a difference as it did over here, where we'd done a much worse job extracting with the coarser grind setting. Super interesting. It would be one where if I had a coarser grind and I was stuck with it, then I'd be thinking a lot more about using this and making sure that I was stirring adequately to get those extraction numbers up. Whereas with a fine grind, I'd be worrying a little less and certainly not being too aggressive with it. You know, just a, a gentle stir I think is plenty. Now in the theme of stirring, one thing I now want to check is, is there any difference between stirring and swirling? You'll know from my V60 technique that I really like to swirl, that kind of movement that is kind of uniform in its action on all the coffee, whereas, you know, stirring is typically more localized around the spoon. In a V60, a bigger deal. In a small AeroPress, maybe not as much. So we'll do a swirl versus stir test two times, just like this, with the finer setting and the coarser setting, and see if there's really any difference, whether it's stirred or swirled. An interesting test, I think with the coarser set, once again, you sort of see the impact of the difference more than you do with the set is ground kind of finer at the sort of finer end of things. Here, there's quite a noticeable difference between the two cups. And there's definitely a little bump in extraction with the swirl. And I do prefer the swirl just for that little extra richness to the cup. Now, this is obviously not the first time I've done these tests. Uh, I've historically preferred swirling over stirring from blind testing through measurement, all that kind of stuff. And the same broadly is true here. Uh, there's not much in it at the finer ground setting. There really isn't. But there's a little kind of extra kick of sweetness and uniformity in that one that isn't there in this. It's a little bit muddier and harsher compared to that one there. It's, it's a single brew, but I think it's a good uh, demonstration of a broader effect. So my preference has always been for swirling, though at finer settings, I don't think it matters that much. Next up is a test that will involve some blind testing for me, so new territory, which is kind of interesting, and that is testing the bloom. Blooming is very common in pour-over brewing, where you add a little bit of hot water to the grounds and let them sort of steep, let them degas a little bit, so that you have a higher chance of an even extraction afterwards. Get rid of that CO2 that's in the grounds that can be a bit of a troublemaker. Typically this isn't done in immersion brewing, but it is done by some people in aeropress brewing. Here's the test. We're going to brew two air presses side by side. One will have a bloom for about 30 seconds and then an additional 1 minute 30 of steeping, and the other one will just have a 2 minute steep, and they'll be brewed otherwise identically. We'll do that twice, with the same ground setting actually, to really dig into this, and then they'll be put into a blind triangle tasting for me, while I'll have to pick the odd one out of three bowls each time. If you're not familiar with triangle tests, they are a better than an AB, because I have to, you know, get one in three right twice instead of 50-50 twice. So the odds of me being accidentally correct are, are much lower. You could do two out of fives, those are all three out of fives, those are tougher still, but triangles I think are enough for today. So firstly, can I pick the odd one out? This is really tough. I'll say right now, if I get these right, it'll be interesting, but the differences are really quite tiny between the two. I oddly feel more confident with this set. I feel like I definitely don't like this. If it's the odd one out, that'd be good. This set is, is more difficult, which is why it's always good to replicate this. Even one triangle test on its own isn't good enough. Two is a barest of minimums. There should be three or four or more, and more people doing them. No, can't. So which was the odd one out here? This one. Honestly, they taste the same. So this one has no bloom. It tastes indistinguishable from the ones that are bloomed. I can't, I can't tell them apart. This I'll be interested if I got this one wrong. Yeah, I got this one right. Interesting, it was a more pronounced difference here. So this is a bloom, and I felt more confident about this. And this is the no bloom. Uh, I liked this less. It just feels a touch harsher and more extracted. Uh, I don't really know why, it, it just is. From this though, I would say that, that blooming doesn't have a staggering impact. If you're steeping for long enough, that's gonna do the work. The infusion is gonna do the work. I'd be shocked, and we'll test it. I'll be shocked if these have much of a difference in their extractions. They all taste really pretty close. Another blind test for me. And this one probably falls under the kind of received wisdom thing for me. It's the topic of do you press to the hiss or through the hiss on an AeroPress? If you don't know what I'm talking about, Maybe you haven't read a lot of air presses. Now, many people say, don't keep pressing once you start to hear the hissing noise. Once you press the liquid through, don't press that last little bit of air through because it makes the air press taste worse. I don't know if that's true. So we're gonna find out. We'll do the same thing we did last time, which is four brews, two pairs, same grind sitting across both triangle tests uh, and see how I fare picking out hiss 
versus no hiss. Now this is blind as before, I don't know what's what in these bowls, but what I do know that's kind of interesting is that the yield difference was pretty small between the two. So if you measure the output of liquid weight between hiss and no hiss, you got six grams more with the hiss, right? So six grams more to about 180 grams of liquid, that six grams would have to taste really terrible to truly impact the flavor, surely. Well, maybe it does, let's find out. Does it make a big difference? I say this is the odd one out, and I would say theoretically that's the hiss, it's a touch harsher, really difficult. Again, first set, really super hard, and, and these are a little cooler. I, I can't, I can't tell the difference here. I just can't. This is, this is a random choice. So if I get it right, which I don't think I will, then know that it's random, that I didn't earn it as a success. I'm gonna say you. That's the odd one out, but I, I don't know. Is it right? No, no, it's not right. Couldn't get it right. Uh, which one is it? It's not you, it's you! So that one was the hiss. No, couldn't tell. Couldn't tell at all. Uh, here, I didn't get it right either. So we can say with some confidence that the hiss, no hiss thing, I don't think it's a thing. It's, it's six grams of liquid that I don't think tastes that bad. I think this is AeroPress superstition. I'd love you to prove me wrong. Let's move on. Now next up is a topic that you could argue is true of all coffee brewing, but I think is particularly relevant to the AeroPress, and that's docent ratio in a way. Now a lot of people say to brew two cups with the AeroPress, what you should do is, is put twice as much coffee in and then dilute the brew afterwards. What I wanna do is a quick experiment to show the impact of changing your dose while keeping the amount of water that you're brewing consistent. How does that impact extraction? So in this brewer, I'll put 12 grams, in this one I'll put 18 grams, and in this one I'll put 24 grams. We'll brew three identical brews, 200 grams of water in each one, same brew time, same process, and we'll taste and compare the output. So we've got our three brews done, 12 grams, 18 grams, 24 grams, 200 grams of water each time. This bowl, as a result, has less liquid in it because coffee retains water in the brewing process, so having more coffee means less liquid output. Now. Having measured them, this has sort of demonstrated a classic principle of coffee brewing and why ratio is so, so, so important. If you change your ratio, you change the dynamics of extraction. This bowl is more extracted than this bowl, which is more extracted than this bowl, because there is more water to do the work per gram of coffee. That's the deal. Now, in the AeroPress, it's very common to say, double up your dose and dilute it down later. This would make a very different cup, once diluted, than this. It's a less extracted cup, a less complex cup, a more acidic cup, so you would have to work harder in your extraction to make this work. I'm not saying it can't be done, but you would need to adapt, so you'd need to grind finer even though it's an immersion brew, uh, and, and you would need to potentially steep for longer uh, or agitate more. You know, you're gonna have to do a bit more work to get the extraction where you want it to be. And this cup tastes nice and clean and balanced. This cup, you can tell like there's a kick up of intensity and acidity. You know, it's, it's getting close to 2% strength, which in filter coffee is really quite strong. This, as it is right now, undrinkable. Really dominant acidity, some quite woody flavors coming out of nowhere. Just, just not a very good brew, fundamentally. And so it's worth bearing in mind if you're looking to adapt the AeroPress to try and get more liquid out of it that you are gonna have to totally change your brewing dynamic using the lessons that we're learning here today. So now I need to talk about one of the big branches of the decision tree of AeroPress brewing, and that is the inverted method. The idea with the inverted method is to have the plunger in the base and you brew with your coffee and water in here. They can't go anywhere, no liquid can drip through. At the end of the brew, you put your top on, you flip it over onto your cup, and you press as normal. Pretty simple. A couple of drawbacks. Firstly, you lose some volume in the AeroPress brew. By having the piston in the bottom here, you actually have a smaller brewing chamber. So I'm gonna brew, as before, only 200 mils of liquid, but bigger brews just will not work, and often smaller brews are preferred. You need the plunger a decent distance in, because at some point, you're gonna flip this thing over, right? And when you do that, the last thing you want is for this plunger to pop out, because in that process, Coffee goes everywhere, it's a hot mess, quite literally. It's the process of agitation that causes a rapid degassing of coffee that creates a bit of pressure inside here that pops this top off, right? So it's that motion of turning that often does it, that initial kind of movement. Things can go horribly wrong. So do, if you do this, make sure your plunger is, is reasonably well seated inside the AeroPress. Now I'm gonna brew three brews here. For reference, We'll do one where we don't do anything. We just put the coffee and water in, see how much goes through, see how badly it damages our extraction. I'm gonna brew a regular method using the, the sort of plunger, holding a sort of vacuum pressure in the top to stop liquid dripping through. I'm gonna brew an inverted method and see if there's really any benefit 
to the inverted method. So we've got the three brews here. We've got the nothing at all. We just let it sort of drain through, though not that much went through that was interesting. We've got the one with the vacuum held on top by the plunger being in, and then we've got the inverted method here. We've pulled the TDS data, and it's let's just say incredibly similar across the board, which is quite surprising. So time for a taste test. Let's do this one. Let's do this one kind of blind. So I'm going to step away. We're going to mix these up, and we'll see if I have any real preferences or if any of them have big strong taste differences. Let's find out. This one is a little bit hollow compared to the first two. It just, it's just lacking a certain something in terms of sweetness. So my guess would be that this would be the one where we just sort of let it drain through and we didn't hold it, let all the water be in contact with all the coffee for as long as possible. These two, more difficult, very similar. I don't have a preference between either of these two, personally. I think they're both very good. I'm, I'm not sure I can, you know, say inverted tastes better than vacuum in the top or vice versa. Let's find out. This is the N for no, nothing. That was indeed the one I thought it was. That one is, I think, the inverted, and that one's the vacuum version. I would say I don't taste a benefit in doing the inverted method. That's my sort of summary here. And historically, that's why I don't really like the inverted method. I don't think there's really a win there. You add a, a lot of risk of hurting yourself, making a terrible mess, and you lose some capacity of your brewer. I don't think you gain much in return. And from a you know relatively blind tasting, I can't tell them apart. The extraction numbers are pretty much identical. I, I think it's just an extra step that's maybe not necessary. Time now for a very interesting topic. And you might have noticed that one of the aeropresses I've been using looks a little bit funny. Something strange is inside it. Let me tell you what's going on. So this plunger, as you can see, has something inside. I asked Gabor, who makes the Smart Espresso Profiler, if he could adapt the plunger of an aeropress, and he could. So you can see here the little mesh in the piston here, and then there's a little tube that connects it to a Smart Espresso Profiler. This will allow me to see, track, record, monitor, control the pressure inside an AeroPress when I'm pressing, which I just think is super cool. So this connects via Bluetooth to my phone, and I will have on my phone a little gauge and also a graph showing me what's going on. Kind of amazing. And why would I want to know? Why does pressing matter? That is a great question. We know from the world of espresso that pressure can be good, but pressure can cause problems in the form of channeling, right? If you have a lot of pressure and you have a weak point in your coffee bed, pressure will exploit that and more liquid will flow through a smaller area. That will taste bad. Now, what we see in espresso grinding is that as you increase pressure, your, in your yield kind of increases and your flow increases, and at some point you hit a wall and you get so much channeling that your yield drops even though you're grinding finer. And so for any grind setting, there'll be a kind of peak pressure before you, you sort of cause channeling. Now, I don't know if channeling happens in aeropresses, but I think we should find out. Now, the pressures are much smaller. For a human being to generate a lot of pressure inside an aeropress is quite difficult. I've really not gotten much past one and a half bars of throwing all my weight on this thing. Let's not brew like that. No one brews like that. Uh, we're gonna be probably working in the range of maybe half a bar of pressure for a kind of normal pressing of an aeropress. Now, interestingly, Alan, the inventor of the aeropress, is very against pressing hard. He wants a nice gentle press. He feels that a higher pressure compacts the bed and that's a problem. I wonder if it causes channeling. He, he, he might be right. Is there a limit to how hard we can press? What I'll do, first of all, is a series of pretty simple brews. I'll brew at ever increasing pressures to see if we suddenly see a decrease in extraction that might be caused by channeling. But that would give me an idea of how hard it might be too hard to press. So I'll do my best. It's quite tricky to do it manually, but I'll start at maybe 0.1 bar, get a 0 0.3, 0 0.6, try one bar, see how we do. We'll use the same grind, same recipe, same everything else, uh, and let's test the results. So we've got our four brews here, starting over actually on this side with the sort of gentlest pressure going up and up and up. Now, the reason this isn't blind is because it really can't be blind. If you look at the color of these bowls, they're all dramatically different. What's happened here, basically, is that the harder we've pressed, the more material has sort of made it through the AeroPress paper. The AeroPress paper is very small, very thin, and I think at certain presses, you just blow stuff through it. And that's what we see here, a ton of suspended material. It looks like a much lighter brew, its extraction level is lower, we'll talk about that in a second, but not as low as it looks. So we knew there was suspended material here. We made sure we, we used these, these little paper filters that f sort of filter out particulate before you refract it and give you accurate readings. No point doing a blind tasting because because it's literally can't be blind because the color is so obvious to show me which, is, which bowl is which. Taste wise, lower pressure, yummy, very nice. I'm very happy with that. Slightly higher pressure, really not much has changed. 
it's a tiny, tiny bit, maybe more stringent. But but confirmation bias, all that kind of stuff, it's not a blind tasting, so don't worry too much. But it's basically a nice cup of coffee. Here, when we got up to sort of 0.7 bars, I started to press with a bit of force. No, really quite hollow, suddenly really harsh, really no sweetness. This tastes like an uneven brew, and I think that is what's happening at higher pressures. We are not having even extraction through that cake of coffee at the bottom of the puck. Let's try 1.4 bars of pressure. A peak. Oh, that is, um, that is wildly unpleasant. No sweetness, no clarity, nothing about that is pleasant. That is a terrible, terrible brew of coffee. And in comparison, this is, is almost heavenly. So uh, I think that the pressure, there's a couple of things. One, the limit of the paper really is quite low, right? Even at sort of 0.3 bars of pressure, you could sort of see a change in the color of the liquid indicating more stuff is getting through the paper. Um, the question this makes me think about is you've had this infusion phase, can you do kind of bed prep, right? Should there be a period of time after you swirl to let the coffee settle down as evenly as possible and sort of prep a neat bed before you press? Will that help the taste? So that's a quick experiment I want to run next where we're just going to do a regular brew and we'll press with identical pressure and then we'll, after we swirl, uh, we'll let the grounds sort of fall down for maybe 30 seconds and then we'll press. Obviously we anticipate a slightly increased extraction from the longer contact time, but I would be interested to see if we feel like there's more evenness in the taste of the brew. So now we have two of the dreaded triangles that are often the undoing of my great ideas. We did tweak this slightly. So with the first brew, we steeped for two and a half minutes to make sure that both brews steeped for the same amount of time because in the second brew, we steeped for two minutes, swirled, let the bed settle for 30 seconds and then pressed. So they both started pressing at 2.30 to make it even. This bowl over here has more sweetness. It's it's quite noticeably different, I would say, to the other two. That feels less enjoyable to me. That feels like the oddball out. This one is the odd one out is B, which would mean I liked it more, and it is the one where you have the settling. So in theory, if I'm right, this one should say A. Does not, wrong. So my confidence was half correctly placed and half misplaced. I would say tasting them afterwards is always a kind of uh, a lesson in how easily manipulated your brain is, right? Like like here, I feel like it made a really big difference and it, it, you know, I picked it quite clearly. Here, it was more subtle uh, and, and now I can taste it afterwards. I can taste that it is the odd one out, but I can't otherwise. From my point of view, I'd probably build it into my technique because I'd rather err on the side of caution uh, and improve things on average than, than not. Right, a, a clean cut win would be beautiful, but really we're into the minutiae of AeroPress brewing here, right? And small details are just that, small details. Let's move on to a big detail in AeroPress brewing. Let's talk about temperature. So first test is actually preheating. Now a lot of people just preheat an AeroPress by pouring some water into the plunger chamber with a paper inside to rinse the paper and do that thing. I, I wanna take it to extreme to see how big the impact is. So this one here is preheating with freshly boiled water. Uh, should be fully preheated. I'll throw it away in a second, throw in some coffee into both of them and put the same temperature water in and we'll see how big of a difference it makes to the brewing liquor, the brewing temperature to have preheated the brewer. So that might be a little bit unexpected. I Certainly found that somewhat unexpected. I thought there'd be at least a degree or two difference, but really heat loss is happening out of the top of the brewer. Uh, and that's the same with your brewer is preheated or not. And that speaks to the thermal efficiency of the material of an AeroPress. You know, if you pour hot water into an AeroPress and you hold it, it takes really quite a long time for that heat to, to get to your hand. So it's a very good insulator, which makes sense. So preheating an AeroPress from a brew temperature perspective, not necessary. And you might say, ah, but what about rinsing a paper? We'll come to that. First, I wanna talk more about brew temperature because it's a highly discussed, highly divisive aspect of AeroPress brewing. Some people really, really believe in the 80 to 85 degrees Celsius thing. Others don't. They believe in brewing as hot as possible. Or we'll use a temperature controlled kettle, load it with different temperatures, and we'll taste our way through and talk about how flavor in certainly lighter roast evolves and changes with brew temperature. So we've got our five bowls going from 75, 80, 85, 90 and boiling point. And this I've done loads of times in my career as an experiment. I think it's really interesting to do as a taste test. If you have the kit and the time, I would recommend you try it. A couple of tiny points to note that as we went down in temperature, the amount of foam forming in the brew decreased and it got harder to press during the pressing portion of each one. Uh, you know, temperature does play a role in viscosity and that probably impacts pressing. Not very important, 
which is kind of interesting. Let's talk about taste. Starting down at 75, it's really not bad. It's okay, it's fine. There's not a lot of character or nuance to it, but it's not unpleasant. There's no dominant acidity, there's no real astringency, it's just nice. And as you go to 80, yeah, it, it gets a bit more of that. You get a little bit more texture, it's very sweet, it's very pleasant, but it's not hugely interesting. What's interesting for me is that these next two bowls at sort of uh, 85 and 90 get worse. Like I think this is better than this and this is worse than everything so far. And then suddenly at boiling point, certainly with lighter roasts, magical, delicious, complex, nice acidity, you know, tastes well extracted. It's, it's the best cup here for me of a lighter roast. The second best cup is here. And that's confusing. I've talked about this phenomenon before in the espresso series, talking about temperature. We did talk about how espresso at 80 can be surprisingly good and maybe at 90 kind of isn't, but at 93, 94, 95, much better again. It's a weird phenomena and kind of proof there's no one way to brew coffee. In addition, if I was using darker roasts, I suspect that these temperatures would do even better and I might get a peak in the sort of 90 or 95 zone compared to the 75 to 80. But the 80 would do pretty well for kind of everything. It'll do well for darker roasts, medium roasts, and light roasts. You just won't get the full range of complexity in your coffee. You'll have a nice cup, but it won't be the best it can be. And searching for the upper end of that brew temperature is gonna give you the best in terms of clarity, complexity, and all of the flavors that you spent your good money on. There's one thing left to talk about, something we've kind of avoided talking about all day, we touched on it briefly when it came to preheating the brewer, but should you be rinsing your AeroPress papers? This is the last question I want to answer before I wrap up, so it's going to be another triangle test. I'm going to brew four brews, two with rinsed papers, two without, two sets of triangles. Can I detect a rinsed paper over an unrinsed paper? So our last triangle tasting test of the video and if I pull this one off, I will be blown away. I'll be very surprised. This is going to be tricky. These brews are identical, except a tiny piece of paper in one case has been rinsed and the other, it's dry. Let's dive in. On either of these, I don't know. I guess you. This is random at this point. That white, this one, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't right. Uh, and I wasn't right. Unsurprisingly, I don't think you can taste the difference between a rinsed and an, uh, an unrinsed paper. This kind of makes sense. The idea that you could taste the difference between a rinsed and an unrinsed paper in an AeroPress is, is kind of interesting, right? An AeroPress paper weighs about 0.17 grams. It's very small. And if you brew, say, 200 mils of liquid with that, your ratio of paper to coffee is, is really quite low. Now at the other extreme, you've got like a Chemex paper, which is four and a half grams. And if you brew say 500 mils of coffee with that, you've actually got 10 times more paper per liter, so to speak, in contact than with an AeroPress. I would say with an AeroPress, it's just an unnecessary additional step and an unnecessary waste of water and potentially heat energy if you're using hot water to rinse that paper. I'm not saying that's true of papers across the board. I'm just saying with an AeroPress, I'm not sure I see a benefit. I certainly can't taste a benefit. Let's wrap up. So firstly, thank you for joining me on this journey into the AeroPress. This video has been an interesting mix for me of demonstrating kind of principles of brewing and also uncovering some new information and running some kind of fun tests. All of this is of course in service of me creating what I hope will be an ultimate AeroPress technique. What I'm trying to do with the ultimate technique is not create the most convoluted and complex recipe with thousands of steps. I want to find the opposite actually. I want to find the neatest, simplest, cleanest way to get you repeatedly to a great cup of coffee with an AeroPress, to have that brewer be an enjoyable part of your morning coffee routine. That's the goal, and of course that's the next video coming up, but it may not have to be the last AeroPress video. There are of course more experiments we could do, there's more questions to ask and answer. Let me know down in the comments below what else we should look at. What other aspects of AeroPress brewing are worth some exploration? I'm not trying to create a, a, the one best technique, I'm trying to offer a great technique. My perfect technique, but there's still so many options, so many different ways to use this brewer. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.